So that's what I'm going to talk about today. The countercultural gospel of the kingdom. Yeah. That's right out of the Bible. The gospel of the kingdom is, is a phrase that's used in the Bible. But we don't hear about it a lot because we've been so brightly taught that it's the gospel of salvation that gets people into the kingdom. And we know in John 3, everybody knows this. You learn it early as a Christian that you cannot enter the kingdom of God. You cannot see the kingdom of God unless you're born again, right? So it's not, though, just about when you die and go to heaven. It's about seeing the kingdom of God in its reality right now, right, now. right here. Yeah. And boy, that's a powerful truth that needs to be repeated. And again, I'm talking about Paul speaking to Titus. And there's an epistle to Titus. It's not preached on that much, but there's a real wealth of information in there for us for today. For 21st century America in 2021, I knew my father really well. He volunteered to go into the military during World War II. He went in and came out. You know, he went in as what, whatever the entry rank is, I guess a private. I don't even know. I haven't served. A corporal private. I don't know. He was at the lowest rung of the ladder. He came out as a lieutenant because they saw leadership on him. And he was a tough dude. He grew up in the Depression, and he served the country. And, you know, if he was going to do it, he was going to be all in for this thing. And we're hearing things like patriotism is racism. That's actually being said in the public sphere. I'm thinking, what would my father think about that? He knew people that died in World War II to defend our right to free speech. And it's just you got to do the same thing and draw the line and say, no, not on my watch. We're going to be a counter culture to that culture. We're going to be the gospel culture, the gospel of the kingdom of God in the earth. And, and we don't do it in, in, a, in a way with weapons, right? The weapons of our warfare are not guns and, and ammunition of this world. It's the truth of the word of God. And it's the power of the spirit of God. And in this quote here, it's right out of Titus 1.5. Paul knew, and again, you could study this on your own, but Cretans had a really bad reputation, almost like hell's angels, you know, might, you might think of today. Like, they're not allowed in. Well, okay, well, you better change the way you're thinking because everybody's allowed in. And Jesus said the tax collectors and sinners are getting at the kingdom ahead of you, Pharisees. What? The people who were supposed to be representing God were missing the mark? Yeah, you know that can happen, right? Yeah. Not here, right? Just say it. Not here. Not on my watch. I love that picture right there where it says about the family. And underneath it says, not on my watch. We're not losing the family while this group of intercessors is active in the earth. Yeah. We're going to come as a counterculture to what the culture is trying to do. And what does it say in Titus 1.5? Sort out the chaos and the unfinished business. Wow. That's where we live right now, isn't it? Yeah. And I believe this is the church's job but to do it in that narrow road that leads to life. Speak the truth, do it in love. Ask the Lord for help if you need it. We all do. So there's just a couple of verses where it talks about the gospel of the kingdom. First one's Mark 1, 14 and 15. Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. I hope you don't think that means that the world is ending. That, that the kingdom of God means that he's coming back, taking us all out of here. No, he's saying the kingdom of God is at hand. There's a new rule in effect yeah. through the ministry of Jesus. He said about Isaiah, today this verse is fulfilled in your hearing. This is the year of jubilee. Yeah. The day of the favor of the Lord. Because we now have Jesus as the perfect human who lived without sin, died without sin, rose into a resurrected form, goes to heaven, puts his blood on the mercy seat, and Holy Spirit gets released. And now all of us have this amazing source of power inside of us if we're Christians. But we have to access it. We have to yield to that power that's in us. Holy Spirit just doesn't take over on his own. You have to say, I want you to take over here. And right, look, if I didn't even think to pray, I, I, I'm a pastor, I preach about this for 100 hours, and, and I still fell into that, oh no, we have to have this by tomorrow, I better get through, I better get, like, what? stop, ask for help. 
That's called prayer. <laughs> and then in Matthew 4, 23, Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Yeah. I'm not going to teach it all today, but that's a powerful phrase. He was teaching the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of salvation is included in that. But too many people think, well, now that I'm saved, it's going to be horrible here for the rest of my life. But once we get over on the other side, then it'll be great. No! Please don't believe that. It could be great right now. It doesn't mean it won't lack confrontation, right? You're... Preaching the good news is not always popular, is it? People want, don't even want to think there is such a thing as sin. And we're being called to say, no, yes, there is such a thing as sin. There are boundaries. And if I love you, it's because I love you I have to tell you what those boundaries are. Your choice. It's still up to you to decide. But this is what the Word of God says. And it's proven to me that, it, that it's true. And you should try it, man. It works really well. So he's preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. And then in Titus 1, verse 5, I left you in Crete so you could sort out the chaos and the unfinished business and appoint elders over communities in each and every city of this island of Crete, according to my earlier orders. So this is his strategy. He anoints Titus to stay on the island of Crete, and Titus's job is to go around the island and start churches and appoint elders. So the people are catching on quickly. You're making battlefield promotions. That's what has to happen. You don't have the time and the luxury to send everybody away to school to learn how to do this. No, there was no school to learn how to do this. They had to start churches and he had to raise up leaders and that means confronting people about things. That's, you know, my wife and I have been doing that for a long time and not everybody likes it. But God loves you all. So he doesn't want just anybody up here as a leader. He doesn't want you to be taken advantage of. That means, doesn't mean we're perfect because if we waited till everybody was perfect, there would be no leaders. <laughs> Starting with us. But I can tell you that my wife is a woman after God's own heart. And I hope she would say, I'm a man after God's own heart. Because that's the goal. It's not that we live sinless, perfect lives. But it's that we're on a journey to try to become more and more like Jesus every day. That's the gospel of the kingdom. While we're here, we're going to make a difference. Yeah. Doris Wagner, somebody we're very close friends with. She's 89 years old. She's still going around the country doing deliverance ministry. Holding conferences. She has, she's missing a leg. She doesn't care. You don't retire as a Christian. <laughs> There's still too many demons for her to retire. I don't think God's ever going to take her. Because like, there's just so many people that need deliverance. She's got like a, a, a no-cut contract. <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean to make light of it. It's very serious work. Verse 10, look at this for today. You see antagonists everywhere. <laughs> Sound like America? They are rebellious, loose-lipped, and deceitful, especially those who are from the circumcised lot. <laughs> They're supposed to be on our team. So I did this at the beginning of the year, January 3rd. My, uh, what the picture the Lord showed me leading into the year started at a prayer meeting that we had at our house with a lot of our leaders in our dining room and extended parts of the house. And as we were praying, I got a vision. And, and you can go back and hear this message. But I, I called it the year of the double backbone. And, and I, you know, the picture I got, I'll, I'll elaborate a little bit on it, but I just wanted you to hear it first. Is, do we think it's going to work? Or are you going to do it from up there? All right, go ahead. So are you going to play it or should I play it? You got the whole thing. I like that. Look at the difference between that setting of the church and this setting right now. This is awesome. Can you imagine trying to preach to people with masks on? I couldn't read your, your expressions. I didn't know if you were happy or couldn't wait to leave. I should start it. Yes, me. <laughs> Can't really see it in this picture, but in this picture, he's praying with the Bible in his hand, and his hands are all wrapped because the night before, he had saved 75 soldiers off the battlefield. He was running into the battle, finding the wounded guys while the warfare is going on around him, dragging them to the edge of a cliff and letting them down by a rope, and his hands were getting shredded by the rope. 
And as he's, he's leaning back in the movie, he says, one more, Lord, show me one more. Ho! Oh. Talk about courage. He even brought two Japanese soldiers. Everybody knows Nate. <laughs> and the medics wouldn't take care of him. <laughs> I know. Think of that. Whatever. Another day's topic. He, he didn't force his faith on anybody. He lived it. That's the spirit side. Marcus Luttrell was more the hammer. Okay? He was shooting people. He was killing the enemy. He wouldn't quit. Two different examples of courage that we have to understand. Sometimes I think the church has been too passive, too much on the sidelines. Don't talk about that. Don't ruffle anybody's feathers. We need a little more Marcus Luttrell. We need a little more lone survivor. I'm never going to quit. But we also need Desmond Doss. That's the double backbone who's going to take the persecution and still not fight back and win them by our testimony. That's a good combination. But it's not easy. Is it? <laughs> Got cut off. So you can go to the next one then, back to me. Because, you know, so, look, man, Jesus said it. It's not easy. The, the road to life is narrow. Why does the road that leads to destruction? So here's two very radically different examples, positive examples. Desmond Doss was from the movie Hacksaw Ridge. Marcus Luttrell, lone survivor. Both soldiers, both, both brave, both very effective in showing their courage, but in very different ways, right? So that was it. It was just a picture of two backbones. One, the Spirit of God being able to interact with people in a non-confrontational way and winning them. The other saying, no, sorry, Cheon, I'm going to the Supreme Court, California, and they won. And the California, California had to pay them back the $1.3 million in legal fees. Now, I mean, I'm sorry, but if it seems like I shouldn't put this other guy up here, I'm putting him up here. Because there's a scene in Saving Private Ryan that I could never forget. Because they really do a good job of showing you the character of these soldiers. And this guy was brought in kind of last minute as a translator, and he was being asked to, to carry a gun. He hadn't really been trained in it. And, and his friend is up at the top of the stairs here being killed by a German soldier. And he's got the gun in his hand. Look at all the bullets around his neck, right? This is a t terrible picture of people in the church today that are afraid to go fight. Amen. And people are dying because we're not willing to do it. That's a missing backbone. Never mind a double backbone. And look, I'm not judging you all. I'm not judging anybody. I'm just saying, I don't want that to be me. Amen. I'm not going to be the guy that said, oh, no, I let them die because I was afraid I was going to get in trouble. No. No. I could tell you about football too, right? They tell you, don't, when you're about to tackle somebody, don't slow down and wince because that's when you get injured. You got to go for the full contact. <laughs> not easy. But look, we're not trying to be hostile people, but we are saying like in, in, a, in a group of bullies, it's all bluff. They're just spouting noise. It was Goliath. It was all just noise, but nobody wanted to fight him until this young guy with courage who knew who he was and knew how to use the weapon that God gave him. He didn't take Saul's armor. He knew that his was a sling. And we need that same kind of thinking. So I realize it's late, but anyway, here's chapter 2 in Titus, verse 1. As to you, Titus, talk to them. Give them a good, healthy diet of solid teaching so they will know the right way to live. Go out of your way to do what is right. Speak the truth with the weight and authority that come from an honest and pure life. That's in the voice. So they're not just listening to your words. They're watching how you live. And if you're not walking your talk, you get torpedoed with credibility. Verse 12 in that same chapter 2. Grace arrives with its own instruction. I love the way they phrase that. Grace arrives with its own instruction. Run away from anything that leads us away from God. Abandon the lusts and passions of this world. Live life now in this age, okay? Gospel of the kingdom. Live life now in this age while you're alive. Give it everything you got. With awareness and self-control, doing the right thing and keeping yourselves holy. He's talking to a bunch of heathen. 
and, and, and Paul finishes this part and he says, Jesus, he gave his body for our sakes and will not only break us free from the chains of wickedness, but he'll also prepare a community uncorrupted by the world that he would call his own. People who are passionate about doing the right thing. Look around and say, I'm sure glad you got saved. <laughs> Carolyn, I'm sure glad you got saved. Does anybody recognize the background? Yeah. What is it? Chosen. It's the chosen. Yeah. And it's brilliant. Because just even in the opening credits when they're doing the show, you see all the fish are gray and they're going in one direction. And then one turns blue and swims upstream. And then after one does, another one does. And then another one does. Say, you're a good-looking fish. That's who you all are. We're not going the way of the culture. We are the counterculture for Christ. <laughs> Taking a stand for him. But just let's think about Crete for a minute, because I know what time it is. Paul challenges Titus to live the truth he teaches. To live the truth he teaches. Sound important? People are drawn toward God, not through bold arguments, but by passionate godliness. We must be passionate about doing the right thing. Our actions tell the story. No, let me just draw the parallel here, right? Because doing the right thing could be phrased by your boss. You've got to sign this form. But read the form, and if you don't agree with it, you're not supposed to lie. But I know you don't want to lose your job. I get that. I really do. I'm not saying that this is like this perfect world that we live in. But wait on the Lord. And wait till he tells you what to do. And you might just be able to go to the HR department and say, I can't sign this. And it's not because I'm a racist. It's because you're taking away my freedom. You're taking away my free speech. You hired me under one premise, and now it's changing. That's not okay. Because if there's overreach, but nobody challenges it, it'll just keep on going. And I'm not a lawyer, so I'll, you know we can put you in touch with the same lawyer that Cheon used to win the, the court case. And, and it's not, you know, that, that $1.3 million was the amount of work, but they weren't going to build the whole church. It's a group of Christian lawyers that donate their time. Many of them are retired and already made their, made their life's work, and they're donating their time. High-quality people, okay? So look, you don't have to do this alone. You're part of a body with a lot of resources, and as soon as you start lying... Okay, look, let's just say it this way. As soon as you can get a group of people in the culture to all sign something that they know is not true, the dominoes are starting to fall. Because we're all good people, but once they get you to do it once, the next one is easier. And then the next one is easier. And look, it just takes some people to say, no. You've overreached, and I'm not doing that. And if you fire me, you'll get sued. Because you have no legal ground to stand on. <laughs> That's called a Christian. <laughs> Not this weak little mealy mouth Jesus. He was a carpenter, okay? He carried around stone, not just wood. I think he looked like Arnold Schwarzenegger, man. He was a big dude. I mean, better looking than Arnold, but muscles. <laughs> we all have spiritual muscles, that's where it matters. And then Paul goes on to say, our actions tell the story. Our lives are living parables, shouting the mystery of godliness. Paul tells Titus to be bold, to teach with authority, and not to let anyone belittle him. We get a clear picture of a strong, courageous giant of a man. That's how they're describing Titus. He's sent to the people of Crete, a people short on virtue and long on vice, to fashion a church of loving disciples. Paul tells Titus that in Crete, there were many rebellious people and deceivers who must be silenced as they were teaching falsehood for financial gain. At that point, Paul quotes a famous Cretan who wrote, Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, and lazy gluttons. <laughs> that writer was Epitomes of Gnosis, a 7th century B.C. poet, prophet, and native Cretan who characterized his own people as liars. If ever there was a place that needed a church, it's there. That's where we belong. Straighten out the chaos. Put things in order that are crooked. Other ancient writers and philosophers concurred. The Roman poet Ovid referred to Crete as 
Mendax Creta, or lying Crete. Like, it was so well known that if you said Cretan, it just implied liar. But not after Jesus arrived. Because the church created a shift. Didn't just go along and start lying. <laughs> it's one of the Ten Commandments, if I remember right. Thou shalt not lie. And look, it's the whole truth. <laughs> Do you swear to tell the truth? The whole truth and nothing but. Whoa, that's a big one, man. Some smart guy figured that one out, huh? <laughs> the Greeks even used the term kretis as a synonym for a lie. <laughs> that's where the church belongs in that kind of culture. Hebrews 12, watch that no one becomes wicked and vile like Esau, the son of Isaac, who for a single meal sold his invaluable birthright. You all know this story, right? God hated Esau. Seems so strong, like an overreaction. But listen, here, let me tell you something about the firstborn. Most of you probably know that they get a double portion of the inheritance, right? But did you know that you also get the most responsibility for taking over for your father? And that means all the responsibilities that come with, with being in charge of everything, that might be more than worth two portions. And he rejected the responsibility of the covenant. What are we doing? Let's not be that. We're here to make a change in the culture, not to just go along with everything. We're here to shine the light. Like it said, oh, I love that language. Your, your life is a living, prophesying parable of the gospel of the good news, and people are dying for it right now. They want truth. It says when he wished to claim his blessing, he was turned away. I don't know if you've ever studied it, but it said he could not reverse his action even though he shed bitter tears over it. So that tells me I got a shot right now. This is my shot while I'm here. And time is going by, and I don't want to stand before the Lord and have him say, you know, like, what happened? Why did, when did you become so afraid? You were a middle linebacker in college. Can't have fear in that position. Oh, but I was a Christian now, and I didn't want to hurt anybody's feelings. What? The gospel's hard news. People don't want to hear that they're sinning. But when you do it the way Jesus did it, they want to stop sinning. And don't feel like they're being judged. I think I'm going to skip through a little bit here. Maybe not. All right, one, I'll do this one. All right, look, he's called the spirit of truth. So if you're being tempted to lie, not just on your job, you know, I've heard so many different people who have been canceled in the culture say that people come up to them on the side and said, I really agree with you, what you, the stance you took, but I can't say anything. Like, well, then you don't really agree. No, that's not what they were saying. It's like, no, but I just couldn't afford to lose my job. Well, when that starts happening, we're in trouble. When you start being afraid to tell the truth, anybody, but especially Christians, because we know that's wrong. You're in the wrong camp. You're lying. Who's the father of lies? Not Jesus. And the Holy Spirit is called the spirit of truth. He will come and guide you in all truth. And if you back up a little in verse 7, it says, if you don't leave, if, if I don't leave, Jesus is saying, the great helper will not come to your aid. But when I leave, I will send him to you. And when he arrives, what's he going to do? Not hurt anybody's feelings. Is that what it says? No, he's going to uncover the sins of the world. Did he uncover your sin? Aren't you glad? Isn't it, this a better way of living than being locked into that old boss? The devil is a mean boss. You never get a raise. And his checks bounce. The wages of that job is death. He'll, he'll uncover the sins of the world. He'll expose unbelief as sin. That's for us too, church. You can be a Christian and have unbelief. That's a sin. Sorry, I didn't write it. And here's a fun one. And the Holy Spirit will allow all to see their sins in the light of righteousness for the first time. <laughs> Sign me up. I get to tell people that what they've believed for the last 40 years is all wrong. <laughs> You've been building your life on a false counterfeit worldview, and you should take on the worldview of Jesus. Their first reaction is going to want to hit me. <laughs> and yet, the truth still marches on, right? Like the battle hymn of the Republic. 
the truth still marches on. The church is still seeing people delivered and set free by the truth. You'll know the truth and that will set you free. Is it fun confronting people about their sin? Well, in one way, yes. Because you know what the outcome is going to be. We, we had a police officer come to the church. Linda led him to the Lord in the lobby. <laughs> she wasn't worried about hurting his feelings when, when she was explaining how this works. Right? So it just all depends on our outlook. It said we got the best news in the history of the world. Why are we afraid to talk about it? I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. I get that. I'm not saying that we should be crude or rude. But somehow, that narrow road that leads to life is available in front of us. There's a lot of roads that lead to the destruction of doing it the wrong way. But we should be pressing in and fasting and praying. Say, Lord, you have us here for such a time as this. I will, I will speed up a little bit here. Uh, yeah, I'm getting close. Right at the end now, in chapter 3, here's what Paul says to Titus. Remember, he's on an island of basically hell's angels, okay? So... When you're with that kind of group, you end up being tough. But he's saying, don't tear another person down with your words. Instead, keep the peace and be considerate. Be truly humble toward everyone. Because there was a time when we too were foolish, rebellious, and deceived. If you can relate to that, would you stand up? Because we're going to close now. Were you ever at a place where you were foolish, rebellious, and deceived? Aren't you glad someone had the courage to talk to you? Because that's what it took. It took them courage. The easiest thing would have been to say, hey, you know, I'm wiping the dust off my feet. You've rejected the word of God, so I'm out of here. I did my job. They didn't, did they? They loved us enough to put up with our foolishness, our rebelliousness, and our deceit. We were slaves to sensual cravings and pleasures. I'm happy to say that was me. You know, I'm not embarrassed to say that. I was buying into the worldview that I was given. And this was the thing that was the most important, that your, your cravings and your pleasures, no, <laughs> wrong. And we spent our lives being spiteful and envious and hated by many. Anybody else? Yeah. How about this? And hating one another. I know about you, but I stopped hating people after I got saved. I don't, I'm not saying I didn't, and I liked what, what everything they were doing, but I realized that's the wrong reciprocal thing. <laughs> when you're trying to get somebody to stop hating, you don't do it by hating them back, <laughs> right? You give them a different model. Keith Holmes is here. He'll tell you what he just shared a great testimony about that exact thing. Anyway, this is the last one. Then something happened, right? So we were hated by many and hating one another. Say it with me. But then something happened. Oh, yeah. Then something happened. I saw the light. Praise the Lord. I saw the light. There was a better way. God, our Savior, and his overpowering love and kindness for humankind entered our world. I don't know if this ever happened to you, but instead of seeing that person who's harassing you as your enemy, you start seeing them as a hurting, wounded person. And now you want to just say, Lord, what can I do to help heal that wound in them? Because this, this is just a symptom that I'm seeing. It's not the source of the problem. The source of this aggression in them is the pain they're feeling inside. And if you can help me cure that and get them to shift into your way of thinking that love wins, not hatred. And often he will do that in very dramatic ways. When you ask him, he'll show you what the root is. And then it says, he came to save us. How many saved here? It's not that we earned it by doing good works or righteous deeds. He came because he's merciful. Can I just ask you, can you start bringing unsaved people to church with you? I mean, they're sick of being home. And all the other options, if you drive by the YMCA not too far from here, it's packed on a Sunday morning. You can't get a parking space at the YMCA on a Sunday morning because there's so many people in there working out. Can you bring one of them to church? Tell them, work out in the afternoon. If we're not even asking unsaved people to come to church, then, then that's part of the problem, isn't it? Like, oh, well, you, 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 if, you, if you just wouldn't worship so long, I would bring my friends. <laughs> Come on. 
could you stop blowing that stupid shofar? They're going to be scared to death. And what's up with the flags, man? I'm getting hit in the head by the flag. See, stop doing that. Stop doing that. We're just not going to cave to that. I mean, that could have been the most important time of the whole day for somebody while we were up here worshiping. Are we going to get it right every time? No. Well, I can tell you that. We're not. But are we going to be listening and trying and pressing in? Yes. Sorry. That's not to please anybody but God. And you might not agree. That's okay. But all I'm saying is over and over we've heard testimonies of, you know, when we thought people were going to be turned off by something that happened. It was the opposite. They saw a demonstration of power. If a demon is coming out of somebody, it ain't a pretty picture until you realize that is a pretty picture because that thing's been in there a long time and it's making noise because it doesn't want to come out. But if you know somebody that needs deliverance, this is the best place for them to be. And we're not embarrassed about our reputation that somebody in church manifested. No, that's how you get free. So could you do that for me? Like, Start inviting some unsaved people. Start asking the Lord to show you. Look, just give it a try. Just come. They'll start crying. I've had that time. So, and it wasn't because the music was bad. <laughs> I mean, there's somebody here right now. I don't want to look up because I don't want to put her on the spot. But she brought her husband. And we were singing that song. Oh, the overwhelming never ends. Reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights to leaves and I. No, I couldn't hurt you, but I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself. Oh, the song he couldn't stop crying and he didn't know why we know why right it's called jehovah sneaky when you least expect it you're in tears on the floor thank you lord it's not that we earned it by doing good works righteous it's he came because he's merciful he brought us out of our old ways of living to a new beginning through the washing of regeneration and he made us completely new through the Holy Spirit who was poured out in abundance. Through the Holy Spirit who was poured out in abundance. So if you just lift your hands, let's just say, Lord, would you pour out your spirit in a greater abundance in my life? And look, you could argue he's already in you. So what we're really praying is, Lord, give us the courage to let you demonstrate yourself through us and not be so worried about what other people think. But be comfortable in who we are as a child of God. That's my first identity, Lord, is as your son and as your daughter. All of us in here, that's our first identity. Not Italian, uh, whoever. It's not our birth ethnicity. It's the new identity that you gave us when we came into the kingdom as children of the living God, full of your spirit and the truth of your word. So I just bless your people, Lord, as they're going to go this week to be about our Father's business. Let us be like Jesus who said, you have food I know not of. My food, the nourishment I get is to be about my Father's business. Lord, let that be true of us as we leave this place today, that when we gather next week, that we can talk about the great exploits, not that we did, but that you did through us by our, our making ourselves available to the hurting and the lost and the wounded people that we come in contact with. Lord, we don't want to settle for anything less than the full abundance that you have for us in Jesus' name. Now, I don't want to be a hypocrite because there might be somebody here who you were brought as a friend and you didn't know what you were getting into. Sure, there's going to be questions and you're not sure about a lot of things. That's normal. But you're surrounded by a group of people who all made a decision to go all in for Jesus. And if that's you, make some noise, please. Yeah. That's legal in this church. You're allowed to make some noise. But it's not a joke. It's a really important decision. I'd say the most important decision you could ever make is who are you going to worship? 
And maybe who you're worshiping right now, if you were like me, it's you. And if you picture a throne in your heart, you're sitting on the throne. And we're just telling you, take a chance. Take yourself off the throne. Put Jesus on the throne. And that's called lordship, because the Lord is a king that sits on a throne. And, and you might say, well, how is that going to work? Don't worry about how it's going to work. Just do it. Just make a decision. Because most of the time, life's not going so well in many different areas. But we're here to tell you by experience and, and the truth to say, it's the best decision that you'll ever make. Amen? Amen. So the way you can do it is just ask him to come. So I'll, I'll say the prayer. We'll all repeat it together. And if that's you and it applies to you and, and you want us to pray with you, you can come down to the altar. But let's just say the prayer. Ready? Heavenly Father, I heard good news today that even though there's sin in my life, the good news is that there's a Savior. Somebody who to come and give his life for me. But I have to make a decision to turn from my old way of living, to take myself off the throne of my heart and put you on the throne so I can call you Lord. I've got way more questions than answers. But something in me is telling me this is the right thing to do right now. So help give me the courage to take a stand for you. I invite you to come into my heart and to be the Lord of my life. I'm willing to listen to your instructions and be obedient to what you tell me to do and how you want me to live. Lord, give me the strength to avoid those sins and to be obedient to you. And this is just thanks now. Just say thank you for being willing to die in my place to take the punishment I deserved on your back to purchase my salvation. I accept you, Jesus Christ, as my Lord and Savior. Fill me with your power so I can live this life in obedience to you. In Jesus' name. Church, could you just pray? Might be somebody here, might be somebody watching online. Prayer makes a big difference, right? That seed is, is just hitting some soil now. And we, Lord, we say that the seed that's hitting the soil, it's finding good ground. And that seed of restoration, that seed of salvation, that seed of the God of the second chance is, is landing on good ground. And the truth is setting people free right now. That it's good to dethrone self and put Jesus on the throne of their heart. So Lord, we thank you for anyone with the courage to make that choice today. And we embrace them in the spirit, Lord, to come in to the family of God, to be that one who cries out, Abba, Father, that spirit of adoption to take over and to let them know that they are just accepted and, and they are the beloved in the Lord now. You will never leave and never forsake them. Just cement that truth into their hearts, Lord, we ask you. In Jesus' name, amen. So look, you know, like we can all do this with the people that you know. And maybe there's somebody here and you said that prayer and like you're all in, you want to be all in. This is the altar. This is what you do. You come up to the altar now and you say, give me my next orders. What do I do? Give me a Bible. I want to learn what you people are talking about because it's foreign to me, but I want to learn. Amen. That's what a church is, right? That's what a church is. It's a group of people that are reflecting God and we're bringing new people in all the time. Hallelujah. Let's give the Lord a hand. Anybody that wants to come, the altars are here. We got people to pray. Even if it's not for salvation, you might want to rededicate your life. There could be a million things you need prayer for. Don't run out. If you can't stay, I bless you to have an awesome day. And we